Secondly, I offer my pranam thousands of times at the lotus feet of my Param Guru Dev to Srila Prabhupada and to all of us, Sri Rupanuga Gaudiya Guru Prampa. And finally, I offer my pranam to all the assembled Vaishnavas and Vaishnavis headed by our Pujapad Sri Bhaktivedanta Bhagavad Maharaj. Since we are rearranging the temple room today, could I ask someone to kindly bring a tosi and keep this here? Because in Bhagavad Gita, Tosi should always be on the right side of the speaker. In, in Mathura, Srila Gurudev was giving class, 
and they then made the asana and kept to see them. She's the she's the prakash of Yoga Maya, who is in charge of the specific department of Madhurya Rasa. So we are very um, eager to have her presence presiding over this assembly of Haikata. So that Yoga Maya Devi will extend her the rays of her mercy and bring us all into a mm, connection relationship with the Divine Kata. So today we want to discuss Guru Tattva. In our Gaudiya Vaishnava philosophy there are many tattvas that have to be understood jiva tattva maya tattva bhakti tattva lila tattva nam tattva rasa tattva but first and foremost is guru tattva if we can understand realize guru tattva then it is only a matter of time, all the other tattvas will be self-revealing. And, if we don't understand, if we don't realize Guru Tattva, then we will never realize any of the other tattvas, actually. So it is the foundation of everything. So, in the 11th canto, in chapter 22, verse 10, Sri Krishna is instructing Uddhav Prabhu. Just before Krishna was about to make his pastimes and this will become unmanifest. So he gives many essential instructions and this particular one is helping us learn about the foundation of Guru Tattva. Very deep foundation. It is not a dogma that the living beings need the shelter of Guru. It is not our party line. It is not sectarian. But it is the logical necessity uh, that arises from clear understanding of the nature of existence itself. So we can uh, chant this verse together and then we'll study word for word the general meaning and the implications. So you can repeat after me. Anadya Vidya Yuktasya Anadya Vidya Yuktasya Purushasya Atma Vedanam Purushasya Atma Vedanam Swato Na Sambhava Danyas Swato Na Sambhava Danyas Tattva Gyogyana Dobhavet Tattva Gyogyana Dobhavet Anadya Vidya Yuktasya Anadya Vidya Yuktasya Purusha Syatma Vedanam Purusha Syatma Vedanam Swato Na Sambhava Danyas Swato Na Sambhava Danyas Tattva Gyogyana Dobhavet Tattva Gyogyana Dobhavet Anadya Vidya Yuktasya Anadya Vidya Yuktasya Purusha Syatma Vedanam Svatona Sambhava Danyas Svatona Sambhava Danyas Tattva Gyogyana Dobhavet Tattva Gyogyana Dobhavet It's a very important and very simple verse also in construction. Try to learn it and keep it in your heart. Here, our <laughs> In Sanskrit there are four ends. So you have to 
know which end it is. So, anadi, the first word, anadi, means without beginning. Avidya means ignorance. It means essentially the absence of knowledge of the Self and of the Supreme Lord. The absence of Tattva Gyan. Yuktasya means of one who is connected. Purusha, Purushasya means of the Purush. In this context, Purush means the individual soul. Hmm? Purushasya Atma Vedanam means knowledge of himself. So if you look at these first two lines, so Krishna is building up systematical, systematic layers of the logical inference. He's saying, Anadya Vidya Yuktasya Purusyatatma Vedanam that the soul who is united with the influence of avidya, ignorance, from time immemorial, Atma Vedanam does not have knowledge of himself. Swato means Swataha by himself. Na is not. Sambhavad. Sam Sambhav means possible. Sambhavad is an ablative case indicating uh, because it is not possible. Na Sambhavad. Because it is not possible for the living entity who is united with a vidya from time without beginning to know himself. Therefore, Babet, there must be Anyas, Anyaha, another person who is Tattvagya and Jnanada. Gyanad so, there must be another person who has knowledge of tattva and can give knowledge of tattva. So, tattva gyan means a person who knows tattva and ganana means who can give tattva. Give that gyan, give that knowledge to the living entity. So, this is the word for word meaning. We'll just give the general translation again. Because it is not possible for the living entity who has been united with avidya since time immemorial to know himself by himself. Therefore, there must be another person who has tattva and can give that tattva to him. This is the translation. Now the implications. Anadya vidya. It's a very Wonderful idea to contemplate. If you will consider it very deeply, you will find it extremely liberating. Extremely helpful. It will transform your life, your vision of everything. Avidya is the function of Maya which makes the conjunction between the consciousness of the living entity and the material elements, ahankar, smanas, buddhi, all of these. So, that means that the soul has been identifying with his ego, body, mind, from a time that has no beginning, because the creation, destruction of the universe is going on again and again in a cycle with no beginning and no end. So our avidya is anadi. It has no beginning. Now that has 
very far-reaching implications. Let's say, if you see a person in a particular situation, you may judge them. Oh, this person is good, this person is bad. What does Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu say about this? Dvaite bhatra bhatra gyan sabha manudam e bhano e manda e sabha brahm The duality of this is good and this is bad is a manodharma, product of the mind. And therefore, it is simply a mistake. He said this in regard to when Sri Lusnath Goswami came with sores on his body and Mahaprabhu was embracing him. Mahaprabhu in humility said, Oh, the Lord has uh, is testing me by sending Sanatana Goswami with his sores on his body. Because if I'll think, Oh, he is not good because he has these sores and I don't have affection for him and I don't embrace him, then I will be breaking my sannyas dharma by having a vision of duality of good and bad. And then Mahaprabhu spoke this verse. Dwaiti Bhadra Bhadra Dhyan the duality of auspicious and inauspiciousness, this knowledge, sabha manu dharma, all the product of the mind, manu dharma. A bala, this is good. A manda, this is bad. A sabha brahm, this is all a mistake. So those who are situated in transcendence, they are uh, not guided or controlled by the worldly vision of duality. In vyavaha, in basic behavior, They'll make some discrimination, but they don't make that control their uh, decisions by which they become critical and, uh, and manifest material partiality, nepotism and all of these things. So, if we see someone, our mind is enveloped in duality by the influence of avidya, so then we begin to meaning of Srimad Bhagavatam, it is said, Tene Brahma Ridya Adi Kavaye Yat Suraya. In the beginning of the creation, the Supreme Lord Sri Krishna enlightened Lord Brahma from within his heart. And now he becomes also a Tatvagya. And Tatvagyo. Tatvagyo, a knower, and Tatvado, a giver of transcendental knowledge. Then the Brahmaji. He imparts that knowledge to Narad, Narad to Vyas, Sila Vyas to Shukadeva, and in this way. And therefore, the, it is an inescapable, inevitable conclusion that no living entity can become enlightened without approaching Sri Guru Parampara. So, this verse encapsulates Srimad Bhagavatam and our Gaudiya Siddhanta, very foundation of the necessity for Sri Guru and the reason why transcendental knowledge can only be received in Parampara. Evam Parampara Praptam Imam Raja Shovidu Sakale Naha Mahata Yogo Nashta Paramatapa. If the Disciplic succession is broken, then the knowledge is lost. So this is our basic Gaudiya epistemology. So in the sixth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, there he said, Yasya Sakshat Bhagavati Jnana Deepa Pratei Guru Matya Saddi Sutam Tasya Sarvam Kunjara Sochabhat Yasa Sakshat Bhagavati, that spiritual master, Jnana Deepa Pratei Guru, the Guru who gives this Jnana, Tattva Jnana, the light of transcendental knowledge, one should consider he is Sakshat Hari, direct manifestation of the Supreme Lord. Yasya Sakshat Bhagavati, directly a manifestation of the Supreme Lord. Guru, our vision towards Guru should be not either or but both. Yadya Piyamara Guru Chaitanya Radas Tata Pijaniya Ami Tahara Prakash. Srila Krishna Das Kharaj Goswami said, Although I know that my Gurudev is Chaitanya Das, 
the servant of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. That means the Vaishnava. Tata Pijane Ami Tahara Prakash. At the same time, I know that he's a Prakash, a direct manifestation of the Lord Himself. So both, hmm, you know, the Maya bodies get mixed up. Hmm? That our Guru is directly God. Hmm? And then others whose faith is very weak, the you know, Guru is not Sakshadhari. He's like an ordinary human being, he just knows more slokas than me. <laughs> so both of these ideas are wrong. What is a Golda Siddhanta? One should maintain both visions at the same time, superimposed. Gurudev is a Vaishnava and also Guru Krishna Rupa Vaya Shastra Pramane. Guru Krishna Rupa Guru Krishna Rupa Haya Shastra Pramane Guru Rupa Krishna Kripa Karen Bhaktakani See, Guru is one form of Krishna in which Krishna gives mercy to the living entities. So both visions, Guru Dev is a Param Vaishnava and also this is one form of Krishna, Krishna Rupa, both at the same time. So, Matyas Yasya Sakshad Bhagavati Jnana Deepa Pradeh Guru Matyasati, if a person, a disciple, will maintain the consciousness, Martya, Guru Dev is a mortal being, hmm? who is subject to the cycle of birth and death, whose body is made of five gross material elements, and mind is made of the subtle material elements. Asadhi, if one maintains the conception that Guru Dev is one temporary element, uh, uh, entity under the control of material energy. Then, even though that disciple studies the Vedas, Srutam Tasya, his study of the Vedas, Sarvam Kunjara Sochavat, it is exactly like the bathing of an elephant, futile, useless, because the elephant bathes in the river to get clean, and as soon as they come out, then they throw the dust all over themselves and they become mm, covered in dust once again. So the bathing was futile. So in the same way, if the disciple maintains a mature conception towards Guru, then he cannot make any progress whatsoever. This is the essence of the Nama Parad Guru Avagya. Even one should not think, my Guru Dev is a great sage. He is one powerful sage, Rishi. Even one should not think, my Guru Dev is a manifestation of Bhagavan, but a partial Etei Changsa, Kala, Pumsa, Krishna, Tu, Bhagavan, Swayam. Krishna has many portions and portions of portions. But one should think, my Guru Dev is direct manifestation of Swayam Bhagavan, Sri Krishna himself of Vrindavan, who has come in this form to deliver me. If this mentality is not there, then it is Guru Avagya. Offense to the Holy Name and all your chanting will not produce results for a long time long time. So it's very important to hear the statements of Shastra and see Guru through the eyes of Shastra, then you will see how the mercy of Nam comes very quickly because that offense has been removed. The power of devotion to Guru has been glorified throughout Shastra in the most beautiful way. In the Padma Prana, there one, sorry, in the Upanishads, it is said, Yasya Devi Prabhakti, Yatha Devi Tatha Guru, Tasyaiti Katita Hyata Prakashanti Mahatmana. Just as one is devoted to the Lord, he should be devoted to his Guru in the same way. And for such a great soul, then the meaning, the direct experience of the knowledge within the Vedas will prakashan. It will manifest and illuminate that devotee's heart spontaneously, simply by having equal devotion to the Lord and to Guru. However, in the Padma Purana, there it is said, Bhaktir yatha haro meisti tadvaristam guru yadi mamasti tena saptena sandar shaitu mei hari. One devotee prays to the Lord, O oh my Lord, if I am more devoted to my Gurudev than I am devoted to you, 
Then on the strength of this truth, may you appear before me. And then Supreme Lord appeared there and then. So it's, even, it's more effective and more powerful to be more dedicated and more devoted to Guru even than to Sri Krishna. And that is more pleasing also to Sri Krishna. So Krishna himself, he has established the importance of devotion to Sri Guru and the glories of Sri Guru in his own life. So please, now, come with me. Don't be in Alachua. Park your body and mind here. And by your soul, we're going to Mathura. Yeah? There in Mathura, See, Krishna has been brought there by Akura. And Kamsa Maharaj made a big plan, plan A, plan B, plan C, to destroy Krishna. Because he realized, I sent so many demons to Vrindavan, but they never came back. Mm -hmm. So it seems that that place, Vrindavan, has some kind of special potency. So if I can take him out of Vrindavan and bring him here, then my war elephant, Kuvalai Apida, can kill him. Plan A. If that doesn't work, then plan B. Some soldiers, our soldiers will attack him. If that doesn't work, Chanura and Mustiks, Chal and Toshal, all the most powerful wrestlers of the world, they will kill him. And more soldiers will help. I may also help. But somehow or other, we have to bring him here, isolate him, surround him, and kill him. And then I'll offer him as the bog to my deity Lord Shiva. Because the wrestling arena was in front of the Rangashala was in front of Rangeshwara Mahadev. So because Kamsa Maharaj was worshipping Lord Shiva, he thought he would kill Krishna and offer him to Lord Shiva. The day of the wrestling match was Shiva Chaturdasi. That was his how he would celebrate Shiva Chaturdasi. Kamsa Maharaj made this plan, however, it didn't work out according to his design, as you know. And Sri Krishna and Balaram, they defeated Chanura and Mustika in the huge stadium with thousands of people watching. And then Krishna jumped up onto the dais where the throne of Kamsa Maharaj was. Kamsa Maharaj took up his sword and shield, but Krishna slapped him and he dropped them. Then Krishna grabbed Kamsa Maharaj by the hair. Hmm? Why? Because in Bhagavad Gita Krishna said, I reciprocate with everyone. So before Krishna's birth, when Kamsa Maharaj was driving the chariots of his sister Devaki on his wedding day, then at that time there was Akashvani, a voice in the sky. Hmm? You fool, Kamsa! Don't you know you are driving the chariots of that woman whose eighth child will kill you? So then Kamsa Maharaj, immediately, he went into defense mode and thought, Oh, eighth child will kill me? Not if I kill her first. And at once he grabbed Devaki by the hair and drew his sword. And he was about to kill her when Vasudev Maharaj pacified him with sweet words and rational arguments. Oh, Kamsa Maharaj, to kill your sister on, on her wedding day, then your Pratishta will go down. He thought, yeah, Pratishta, I've got to protect my Pratishta. <laughs> mm -hmm. So in a very clever way, he appealed to Kamsa Maharaj's demonic qualities mm -hmm. to avert the... the potential murder of Devaki at that moment. So, because Kamsa Maharaj grabbed Devaki by the hair, so that's why Krishna grabbed Kamsa Maharaj by the hair. Oh, you grabbed my mother by the hair? Let's see how you like it. Prapatente. Krishna reciprocates with him. So then he threw Kamsa Maharaj from the high dais. Splat! Onto the floor of the wrestling arena. Actually, when Krishna did that, Kamsa died then. 
People think that Krishna then jumped on him and punched him so many times. That's what killed him. But actually he was already dead. Krishna, just, well, he, Krishna was just like venting steam. <laughs> uh -huh. So he just, just wanted to punch him a few thousand times just to get it out of his system. Kamsa was already dead. So then everyone was astonished because they all thought that this coward boy was the son of Nanda and Yashoda who had come from Braja, but now everyone, all the mm, prominent people and kings of the world saw that Krishna had killed Kamsa Maharaj. And because the demigods had said, mm, Asistan Astamogabo, the eighth child of Devaki will kill Kamsa, because they saw with their own eyes Krishna kill Kamsa, then there was no doubt in anyone's mind, he's the son of Vasudeva and Devaki. Mm -hmm. Paman. He's the son of Vasudeva and Devaki. And they told him. And Krishna was, what? <laughs> he couldn't believe it. Yeah. And now you have to stay with us. You're one of us. You're not one. Forget dairy farm. <laughs> hmm? You're not a milk boy. Forget that, you're from the royal family, you are the aristocracy of the famous Yadu dynasty. You are a Katriya. <coughs> Krishna was confused. Hmm? It was an identity crisis for him. <laughs> Teenage life. Huh? So they... Mm, and Balaram, Balaram really is the son of Bosudev and Rohini. So then he had to stay there. Hmm? And uh, Krishna, he thought that if I go back and leave Balaram here, Balaram will die. And if I go back to Vrindavan now with Balaram, then Vasudev, who in his whole life never saw his son because Rohini was pregnant and then she went to Gokul and gave birth there. So Vasudev is seeing his own son for the first time in his life for a few days and then he loses him. Mm -hmm. After so many of his other children had been uh, cruelly killed by Kamsa Maharaj, so that would be too painful for Vasudev. So Krishna decided that Krishna and Balaam will stay in Mathura for some time, satisfy the Yadus, and they promised Nanda Maharaj, after satisfying the Yadus, we'll come back to Vrindavan. And so Nanda Maharaj left Mathura and returned to Vrindavan with a very heavy heart. So now Krishna is in Mathura. Vasudev and Devaki were thinking, we have to give him the samskar, that he's a Katriya, that he's one of us. So in life, you know, there are, there are ten samskars that you have to go through, from before you're born until Garbhadan samskar, until after you die, also, the Antim samskar. Such as, and one of them is the initiation, that is Upanayan samskar, receiving the sacred thread and receiving the Brahma Gayatri. So of the four castes, the upper three castes, they are Dvija. The upper three castes all receive the sacred thread and the Brahma Gayatri. They're, all, they're twice born. However, the way in which that initiation takes place is different. It's a different vidhi for each caste. So Brahmin boys, they receive their thread and Brahma Gayatri at the age of eight. And the Katriyas received the thread at the age of 11. And Vaishyas, Gops, like Krishna's caste, they received the thread at the age of 12. So when Sri Krishna came to Mathura, he was 10 years and 9 months. Right? So he was almost 11. So that means it's right on time for the Katriya Upanayan Sanskar. But he has no Upanayan Sanskar from inbred because the Gop's initiation will take place in the following year. <laughs> because he's a Brahmin, so he can have that when he's 80. <laughs> so, at that time, the, the student, he becomes a Brahmachari student and receives Brahma Gayatri, which was re revealed by Vishwamitra Muni in the Rig Veda. So now Krishna has been in Mathura for some time and Basudev Maharaj, he said, I am the father, I have to now arrange his Upanayan Sanskar. But the mother and father should be present. So he and Devaki are there, but Balaram's mother is not there. Balaram's mother is still in 
go in the Nandegaon, in, in Braja. So then Vasudev Maharaj, he wrote a letter to Nanda Maharaj requesting. In that letter it said, oh My dear Nanda Maharaj, when you came to Mathura, at that time I didn't think of it. But now the time has come for the Upanaya Sanskar of my sons. And therefore their mother should be present. Please send Rohini to Mathura. So when Nanda Maharaj read this news to Nanda and Yashoda, then Rohini was in a dilemma. Because now Krishna and Balaram have gone to Mathura. Mother Yashoda is burning in the fire of separation. And Rohini is there, she's also lost her son. But she's there and she's comforting and giving some, trying to give some consolation to Yashoda because she's her best friend. So she's thinking, now if I go, how can I leave her? What will happen to Mother Yashoda? And she said, O Sati, only if the Creator could make a duplicate of each one of the limbs of my body, and in one form I could stay, and then in another form I could go there, then this problem could be solved. Mm -hmm. So she couldn't make a decision. But Mother Yashoda, who is very soft-hearted, she said, Oh, Saki, actually, the Creator has already made two bodies with one prana. Our prana is one, but one body is your body and one body is my body. But we have the same prana. So, if you go to Mathura and you meet with my Krishna and Balaram, then it will be just as if I have gone to meet with them. And then, if you go there, I'll feel relief from separation. Because myself, in the form of you, uh, will be meeting with them. He said, this is the proof. I never distinguish between my son and your son. I consider Krishna and Bhara both are my sons. So this shows we are one prana with two bodies. So when Madhya Yashoda encouraged her in this way, then they consulted with some astrologers to find an auspicious time uh, to go to Mathura. I don't know how they did that. What's the auspicious time to leave Vrindavan and go to Mathura? I don't know. But anyway, somehow or other they calculated it. Yeah. And so Rohini was put on a bullock cart with some Madhya Shoda to cook so many preparations mm. with the, mm, ghee and yogurt and different milk products and also some clothing and ornaments. She prepared gifts and put them on the bullock cart and all the mothers were there. Mm. And when Rohini set out for Mathura, they followed her for a long distance. And all were weeping. All were crying. Then they... With heavy hearts, they returned to the village. And after some time, Mother Rahini arrived in Mathura. When she arrived in Mathura, a wonderful thing happened. Krishna and Balaram, you know, they're staying there. Everyone is a Mathura Basi. No one understands how they feel about Braja. But now Rohini, who was there for the whole time, all their Braja Though she's the wife of Bosadev Maharaj and she's a Katriya, actually she's more like a gopi. In her heart she's completely a Brajabasi. So when they saw Rohini, Krishna and Balaram were weeping and they fell down at her feet and gave pranam. And the moment Krishna and Balaram gave pranam to Rohini, at once they had a spurti of Madhya Shoda in their heart. Uh, as if Madhya Shoda were directly present there, and Rohini also had a spurti of Madhya Shoda in the heart. And so they were all together, two boys and their two mothers. Hmm? This is the inconceivable nature of praying. Hmm? Because when we meet a person who has love for the person we have love for, then just by meeting them, that person becomes present. I remember... In 1996, it was the first day of Kartik. Sila Gurudev was sitting on the Vyasa side and he was beginning the, the first lecture of the month. And exactly just at that time, his dear 
very dear and senior god brother Srila Bhaktivedanta Trivikram Goswami Maharaj he just arrived he just arrived from Bengal and he came into the temple room from the, from the back and when Gurudev and Srila Trivikram Maharaj saw each other and he came and sat next to him on the Vyasa Sam both of them were crying bowing down to each other with tears in their eyes and I thought at that time how wonderful just see the sweet relationship of affection between these God brothers hmm, who have served together for so many years hmm, since they were quite young and now they are very old hmm, so they have a long history of service together and it struck me how deep was their love for each other at that time I felt like that now 21 years later I see it in a different way that when they saw each other and bowed down, they both had a spurti of Srila Bhakti Pragya and Keshav Goswami Maharaj. And that's why they were weeping. Hmm? Why? Because who is the devotee of the object of love is a vibhav. Hmm? You know? The devotees of Krishna, they are the hmm, Ashaya Lamban. So they are vibhav, that is the category of that which stimulates the love for the object of love. So because each of them have so much love for Srila Bhakti Praga and Keshwar, seeing each other, then their love for him was intensified. So this is the nature of Prem. So when Krishna and Bharam bowed down to Rohini and Rohini embraced them, Madhya Shoda appeared there in the consciousness of everyone. So beautiful. So after that, Mother Rohini, now she was there, she couldn't stop speaking about Braja. But Basudev and Devaki, they didn't want to hear about it. Hmm? They were indifferent. They didn't want to hear about what's going on in Braja, what happened there. The, and the boys also, they should not think about that. Hmm? That was just some, because of some politics. Hmm? Now that's over. So they were indifferent. And the other ladies noticing that it was an awkward situation, between Rohini speaking so lovingly about Krishna and Bharam and Vrindavan and Vasudev and Devaki not really approving of that. So then they just tried to mm, pacify the situation a little bit by making a joke. Oh Rohini, you're just always talking about Braj because you're so greedy for the butter and the yogurt there. <laughs> so then Rohini, then she began to keep her feelings to herself. So now the mother is here, Vasudev can manage the Upanayan Sanskar, receiving sacred thread for his sons. When and he told Krishna and Balaram, and when Krishna heard this, he was feeling very sad. Why? Because his mamata, his possessiveness, my father is Nanda Maharaj. My father should organize my Upanayan Sanskar, and now I'm here, and this person. He is very loving to Krishna, but Krishna in his heart, he has Mamata for Nanda Maharaj as his father. And now he is organizing, if my father will hear about my Upanayan Sanskar, he will be very sad. So Krishna was thinking of a way how he could soften the pain of that experience for Nanda and Yashoda. So then Sri Krishna wrote a letter and said to his father, he said, Oh, Peter Sri, my dear father, now in Mathura, I have this situation where I have to undergo this Upanayan Sanskar according to Katriyapiti, the rules of the royal family. But you should know in my heart that I never accept this. I'm only externally going through this ritual. But in my heart, I am Gopal. <laughs> Gopal is Gopal. He'll always, he'll always be Gopal. You'll never be a Katriya. We don't accept it. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Correct. <laughs> he said, I never accept. I'm outwardly just playing along with this just to satisfy the Yadus. But in my heart, I'm a Gopal, I'm a coward boy, and you're my father. 
So just to make, make it that this ceremony is not useless, on exactly the same time, on exactly the same day, you should do the Upanayan Sanskar in Braja for my coward boyfriends who are eligible for that. Because we are one in heart, they are just like me. Hmm? So when you, on that day, when the mm, Gagacharya makes me mm, say my vows, Om Kama Karu, will you do your duty? And the Brahma Chaps will say, Om Bharam. So when I reply, Om Bharam, in the affirmative to take the vows of the Upanayan Sanskar, at exactly the same time, myself, in the form of my friends with whom I am one, who are so close to me, in Braja, they will tell, Om Bharam, and then my words will not be untrue. Hmm? So Krishna very cleverly told his father to arrange the ceremony in this way, so it would not give pain to him that he was becoming a Kathriya, mm -hmm. and that Krishna now staying there had not become indifferent to the Brijabhasis. Mm -hmm. Because out of humility, when separation comes, humility rises. And when that humility comes, one feels oneself to be unqualified, to be a father or to be a friend or to be a lover depending on what is the relationship with Krishna. Or perhaps Krishna became indifferent to us now. But Nandamaraj now he realized Krishna is not indifferent to us at all. So he told his mm, elder brother Upananda and Abhinanda. And amongst them, on the same day, they did Upanayan ceremony for Krishna's coward boyfriends in Braja. So then, after Krishna had received the ceremony, when you receive the sacred thread and the Brahma Gayatri, that means you are now eligible to begin the study of the Vedas. So you have to go to Gurukul. So Krishna and Balaram were thinking, where shall we go to Gurukul? And what teacher shall we approach to take shelter? So they thought, who is qualified? Well, Narada is qualified, Vyasadeva is qualified, but we can't go to them because they are Vaishnavas. And Vaishnavas, they know Krishna is too Bhagavan Swayam. That Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Then how will they be able to go through the pastime of educating us because they know that we already know everything. <laughs> better than they do. Eh? So that's not going to work. So Krishna and Balaram, they were talking to each other and they decided the best thing to do is to go to a Shivite Guru. Because Shivites, they don't know Krishna Tattva, Balaram Tattva. So they thought, there's one, it should be a Shivite who has realized Brahman. Hmm? By the mercy of Lord Shiva, he's realized Brahman. So they knew, there's one Shivite from Kashi, from a very famous line of Brahmins in Kashi. And for some time he went and he lived in Prabhasketra. And then after that he came to Ujjain, Avantipur. And he's established a Gurukul there with hundreds of Brahmin boys and he's teaching them. Let's go to his ashram. So Krishna and Bala, Balaram, they decided, they selected, he'll be our guru and this will be our gurukul. Then they were thinking that if the demons, the associates and the allies of Kamsa Maharaj know that we have both left Mathura, then they may attack and make problems for the Yadavas, thinking that the Yadavas, the Yadudanisti are weak at that time. So we should go to Gurukul in such a way that no one knows that we've gone to Gurukul. Hmm? So Krishna and Balaram publicly announced as princes of the Yadu dynasty that now for some months we'll be undergoing severe austerities, brats and study in the privacy of our rooms in our palace. We are not to be disturbed by anyone. So they closed the doors and they went inside and not, then no one saw Krishna and Balaram for some months. But what really happened, in the middle of the night, secretly, Krishna and Balaram, with sh shaved heads, carrying dandas of kadir wood, with rings made of kush grass, with upper and lower silk cloth and a, a deer skin over the top of that, dressed as brahmacharis, they set off from Mathura, secretly, incognito, and they began to walk 600 kilometers 
all the way to Ujjain, to Avantipur. So, they were incognito. No one knew who they were. And they were walking for miles and miles because brahmacharis are not allowed to use a vehicle. Did you know that? So now they were brahmacharis, they couldn't go by a chariot. Right? Until they graduate from, from their gurukul, after that they could use a chariot. But before it was not possible. So they had to walk all the way. And they were walking through so many villages. So especially when Krishna and Balaram walked through the cowherd villages, then at that time they were reminded of Vrindavan and their hair stood on end and they were wishing, oh, I wish we could go back to the good old days when we were cowherd boys. And sometimes they were walking through the villages and the young girls of the villages would see them. How beautiful! Hmm? was Krishna and Balaram and some girls would talk to each other oh look at that brahmachari definitely in the future some young woman is going to be very very fortunate yeah. whoever marries this brahmachari she'll be very fortunate hmm? she'll be very fortunate to embrace him in her lap she'll be feel the most fortunate when she, he decorates her body paints her body with the sandalwood paste. And like this they were thinking in this way upon seeing the beauty of Krishna and Krishna was covering in his ears. Shri Vishnu, Shri Vishnu, Shri Vishnu. Hmm? So I can't listen to this because I'm a brahmachari now. In Vrindavan it was okay to listen. Over here, over here what the gopis are saying. But now he's saying, now I have to be a brahmachari. I shouldn't listen. Hmm? So somehow or other Krishna managed to control himself and he arrived in Avantipur. When he came to Avantipur, Sandipani Muni was sitting there on the asan with hundreds of effulgent young Brahmin boys all studying <coughs> under his guidance. And Krishna Bharam came into that assembly. But their effulgence was outshining the the fulgence of the other students. All the students were astonished seeing Krishna and Bharam, but they didn't stand up and they didn't give obeisances. Why? We are Brahmins. And they could see from the physique, oh, this, these are, they're not Brahmins. Uh, very strong. Hmm? They must be Katriyas. So they didn't get up. But they, in their heart, they were very respectful, but they didn't give pranam because they're uh, cast pride as being Brahmins. So in Krishna and Balaram, they folded their hands and gave Dandavat pr Pranams to Sandipani Muni. And they said, O oh great Brahman, you are ocean of transcendental knowledge. We surrender to you. Kindly save us and remove our ignorance and de deliver us from the ocean of birth and death. This is how one approaches the spiritual master. So when Sandipani Muni saw them, then he asked them, Oh, what is your Varna and your Gotra? So Krishna and Balaram, they wanted to stay anonymous, so they didn't say, I'm Krishna and Balaram. They said, we are of the Yadu dynasty. And my Varna, Varna also means color. And Balaram is fair and Krishna is dark. So they became known as the fair Yadav and the dark Yadav. <laughs> in, that, in the Gurukul. Fair Yadav and dark Yadav. Sandipani Muni said, Oh boys, the time for study is precious and very rare. Hmm? You can think in your life, huh? you know, when you're young and you're a student and you go to college, that time you're absorbed in your study day and night, you can absorb so much. But then after that, when you go into the practical dealings of life, then how much time do you have for study? Mm -hmm. Not so much, in most cases, not so much. Mm -hmm. So we should know that when we have the chance to be with Vaishnavas and just be absorbed and deeply study Shastra, this is most rare and precious moments. We, should, we must take advantage of that. 
She said, my boys, the time for study is very rare and precious. Therefore, I am going to keep you here with me for a long time. And in this way, very lovingly, they were accepted into the Gurukul. Sandipani Muni said, you have to give up your uh, awareness, your ego of being Katriyas, and you have to go to beg with the other boys. So in Gurukul, the students, they have to go to beg door to door. So Krishna and Bharam, they were sent out with the other Brahmin boys. And the Brahmin boys would come and knock on doors. Mm. Bhavati Bhiksham Dehi, or respectable lady, please give me arms. And they would ask for something. They would sometimes receive, sometimes not. But when Krishna and Balaram went begging, they were astonished. Because Krishna and Balaram, as soon as anyone saw them, without them even saying everything, oh, take this, and everyone was just giving. <laughs> so they would come back and they would offer so many things they beg to their Gurudev and it would be distributed in the ashram for the benefit of all the students. So this was going on, their Gurukul life was going on. One day, the wife of Sandipani Muni, she said, out of all your students, my dear Swami, my dearest husband, out of all your students, which of the students are the most devoted? Hmm? Sandipani Muni said, those two Katriya boys. His wife said, but I never see them serve you. He said, yes, because hmm, it is their nature that they do service, but not openly, not publicly. They serve me so much, but they do it very secretly and in such a way that no one sees what they're doing. And that's why you have not seen. So we see the example set by Krishna and Bhara in serving their Gurudev, it was not for show. It was not to get the approval and praise of other people. But behind the scenes, they relished serving and pleasing their Gurudev uh, without anyone knowing unconditional, unmotivated, niskapat niswarta guru seva, without duplicity and without selfishness, they serve their spiritual master. One day, the guruma, guru mata, she asked Krishna Bharam, can you bring wood from the forest? So Krishna Bharam set out into the forest and they were collecting wood and then suddenly the sky became black and there was heavy rain. There was a heavy downpour and it became so dark they couldn't see, it was flooded on all sides and they couldn't return to the ashram. The next morning when Sandipani Muni found out that they were lost in the forest in the dark and the rain, he became so upset he didn't take bath, he didn't do his Gayatri treatment or anything. He just got up and he set out with the other students, searching here and there. Oh, dark Yadav, light Yadav, where are you? They spread out in the front, and the boys found them first. So when the boys found Krishna and Bharam, then Krishna and Bharam were laughing and joking with them and telling them how they'd spent the night alone in the forest, holding hands, shivering, waiting for the morning to come. Hmm? But then when their Gurudev arrived, Sandipani Muni, then they became very shy. They became quiet. Hmm? Sandipani Muni said, Oh, for my service, you have sacrificed your own comfort. So I bless you that all transcendental knowledge will appear in your heart and remain ever fresh. This he did not say, that was a hardik dan. You know, mercy comes in different ways. It can be by words, vachik dan, alok dan, by glancing, or it can be by a heartly blessing. So in his heart, he gave this blessing to Krishna and Bhara. So he embraced them and brought them back to the ashram. So, Krishna and Bharama staying in Gurukul, they're sleeping on the ground at night. But at night when Krishna and Bharam went to sleep, they could not sleep. Hmm? Krishna said to Bharam, Oh Bharam, it's very difficult. 
I'm trying to not remember our life in Braj. Because when I remember that, I feel so much pain. I try to remember my friends, new friends in Mathura, my new mother and father in Mathura. Jai Sisi Radha Govinda Jyoti. I try to remember my new mother and father in Mathura. But even when I just think of the word mother, then at once I remember Yashoda. When I think of the word father, at once I remember Nanda Maharaj. And I see how he's become so weak now in separation from me. Even his friends don't embrace him because his body is so hot. They think that it would be like entering into a fire. Balaram, what can I do? Balaram said, Oh brother, it's true. Actually, I feel so restless. I want to just get up and run away from Gurukul and go back to Braja. But we'll have to hold our patience. But one thing I've experienced, that when I remember Nanda Maharaj and Yashoda, then at that time, as if like a dream, I see them, I speak to them, they speak to me. And it's more than a dream even. Krishna said, you're right. I also have that experience. When I remember them, it's like a dream, but it seems to be real. And when Krishna and Balaam re revealed their heart to each other, how they were remembering their parents and friends and cows in Braja, they were weeping and Krishna and Balaam embraced each other and Krishna and Balaam fell asleep in each other's embrace. So gradually they were sleeping and they, in the night they rolled apart and Krishna was lying there. But then in his dream, Krishna saw that he was on the bank of Jamuna. It was night time. He was playing his flute. And Simati Radhika Lalita Vishaka Chitta Champakalata and all Braj Gopis who are his life and soul. They're the life of his life and soul. They'd all come there. And Krishna was dancing with the Braj Gopis. Tatra Tisu Shubeta Bi Bhagavan Deva Ki Sutha Madhyamani Namahimana Mahamarakato Yata. Shukadev Goswami said, when Krishna is dancing, there's Krishna and the golden gopi. Hmm? Bluish Krishna and golden gopi. Bluish Krishna golden gopi dancing in a circle. At that time, Tatra Tisu Shube. He, become, he becomes excessively beautiful. Hmm? More than ever before, he never looks so beautiful because Krishna, though he's beautiful, but he's more beautiful in the company of those devotees who have the highest love for him. So, he was like a marakata jewel uh, set in gold. So, marakata jewel is actually emerald. We know that Krishna is bluish like a sapphire, but Shukadev Goswami said he was like an emerald set in gold. Why is that? Because when the golden aura of the Braj Gopis, when Krishna's Sham colored complexion is based in the golden order of the Braj Gopis. He seems to be green like an emerald. In, in Braj Basha, there's a famous poem. Merabhava Padaharo Radha Nagarasoi Jatana ki chai pare Sham harita duti hoi. Oh, Shimati Radhika. I'm begging you, please remove the obstacles to my bhajan in this material world. You are so beautiful and so powerful that when your aura falls upon Shama Sundar, then Sham becomes Harita Duti. He becomes green in complexion. So, though Krishna is so beautiful, even the ornaments that he wears, they don't beautify him, he beautifies the ornaments. But when Krishna is in the company of the Braj Gopis, then the Gopis beautify Krishna, make him more beautiful. 
Krishna in his dream was so happy he was dancing in Rasalila. Padanyasa Bhuja Vidutibi Sasmita Bruvila Sai Madhyan Vajjais Chalakuta Patai Kundala Gandalola Swidhyan Mukya Kabara Rasana Grantaya Krishna Vadvo Gayantastham Tadida Ivata Mega Chakra Virejahu Shukadev Goswami paints a beautiful picture of Rasalila. Gopis are doing padanyas. That means in their classical style of dance, they place their feet in different positions, in different rhythms. Padanyasa, bhujabi dutipi. Their arms are moving very quickly, striking one pose, one mudra after another. Sasmita, they're smiling. Bru vilasa, and their eyebrows are also dancing. There are different movements in Bharatanatyam that the eyebrows also have to dance. Their waists were trembling. Hmm? Their hips are moving. Hmm? And they'd taken their upper cloths. And they were very colorful and they were swinging them around. So when they were spinning, their different color cloths were spinning also. Hmm? Their faces were decorated with drops of perspiration. Hmm? And they tied the knots, Kavara, Grantaya Krishna Vadu. When their cloth was coming loose, then they tightened it again. Krishna Vadu, Gayanta Stam Tadita Ivata, Mega Chakra Virejuhu. And they were singing Krishna's names, Krishna, Krishna. And they appeared like flashes of lightning on a dark cloud. The implication here is. Shukadeva Goswami is describing each, the movement of each part of their bodies. Why? Because that was their style of dancing. That their feet moved while the rest of the body was completely still. Then the feet became still and the eyebrows danced. And the eyebrows became still, then the arms moved. Hmm? And then the arms stopped and then the hips moved. So they, have the, they isolate each part of the body in quick hmm, rotation. So the dancing looks so beautiful and supernatural. This is the, what Sukadev Goswami is expressing here. And also, that they became like flashes of lightning on a dark cloud when they were chanting Krishna, Krishna. This is expressing the glories of the Holy Name. Because there's a sequence here. The ornaments of Krishna don't make Krishna beautiful. Krishna makes his ornaments more beautiful. The gopis make Krishna more beautiful. And the Holy Name makes the gopis more beautiful. So here in Rasila, Shukadev Goswami is expressing the glories of Harinam Sankirtan. Even the gopis who make Krishna more beautiful, Krishna is already impossibly beautiful. By Yoga Maya, the power to make the impossible possible. Krishna is so beautiful, it's impossible to be that beautiful. But he becomes more beautiful in the company of the gopis. But the gopis become more beautiful when they do Harinam Sankirtan. So Krishna was experiencing all of this. Tabi yuta sramama poeta manga sanga Grishta storja so kucha kumkuma randitae Ganda vapali beer nudat abisadva Santo gajibi ivaradi babinna say to who After dancing with the Pratigopis, then see Krishna wearing a garland that was crushed by embracing them and fragrant with the kumkum from the breasts of the gopis was smeared upon his garland. Along with those beautiful coward maidens, he came to the bank of Jamuna and they entered into the water, followed by swarms of intoxicated bumblebees who were singing their glories. And entering into the cool water of Jamuna, all branch gopis became relieved from the fatigue of their very enthusiastic and energetic dancing. So Krishna was experiencing all of this. But then suddenly he woke up and saw that he had a shaved head and was doing austerity, sleeping on the floor of the ashram in the Gurukul in Ujjayi. Krishna was so disappointed and thrown into the ocean of separation. He thought, what kind of dream was that? And he let out a long sigh. 
And when he breathed in, he could smell the conkum from the bodies of Pratigopis. And he realized it wasn't a dream. His body was actually fragrant with the fragrance of their kumkum. And then he thought, it wasn't a dream, it was real. And now, alas, alas, my brahmachari is broken. And then Krishna calmed him, so he settled himself down. He said, well, I didn't do it intentionally, so it doesn't count. <laughs> it wasn't my intention. And anyway, the gopis of Vrindavan, who were dying in separation, now they can live for another day. Because he realized that that dream was not a dream, it was real. Hmm? And those pastimes that he experienced with the gopis, there in Vrindavan, in Spurti, in separation, the gopis were also experiencing it at the same time. That is called the Gona Vishesh Sambhog. It's a special type of meeting, a secondary type of meeting, not a Mukya, primary, but a secondary type of meeting, which is not just a meeting in a dream, but when two persons have the same dream and experience it together, this is called Gona Vishesh Sambhog. So Krishna pacified himself, said, well, it wasn't intentional, so I didn't break my vow. But more importantly than that, the gopis of Vrindavan, their life has been saved. So this is Sri Krishna's life in Gurukul. So when he was there in Gurukul, many years later, you know, he met another boy, a Brahmin boy, who was in that Gurukul, whose name was Sudama Brahmin. And he was reminiscing with him, oh, do you remember our days living in the ashram of Sandipani Muni. So at that time, Krishna said, Naham ijja prajati byam tapaso pasame nava tusse yam saravabhut atma guru susru srayayata Krishna speaking his own realization and experience. He said, I am the Atma of all living beings, Sarvabhut Atma. I am the soul of all living entities. And I am not so much satisfied by Naham Ija. General meaning Ija means worship. Prajati Bhyam means birth in a high family. Naham Ija Prajati Bhyam Tapasa Upasana By the performance of austerities or Upasana. Service in meditation. I am not so pleased by all of these things as I am pleased, Guru Susru Srayayata, by that person who listens to the words of his spiritual master and serves his spiritual master with great faith. So this verse has, is very, very deep. See, Sridhar Swami, the original commentator on Srimad Bhagavatam, he said this verse can be understood on two levels. Because there are two types of guru. The guru who is Brahmanishta and Bhagavad Nishta. The guru is Brahmanishta, he is that one who wants to bring one to the level of Brahman realization. And Bhagavad Nishta, that is the guru who is established in Bhakti. So if we take it from the first perspective, if the guru is Brahmanishta, then Ija means the performance of sacrifice which is the duty of the householders, Grihastha. Prajatibya means if one takes birth in a Brahmin family, then he'll receive the Upanayan Sanskar into Brahma Gayatri and then he'll study the Vedas as a Brahmachari. Hmm? So then Tapasa, austerity means when a person's household life is complete, then he may, along with the wife, give up all social engagements and retire to the Holy Dharma and do austerities, vanaprastha life. Hmm? Then, uh, upasamenava is the internal meditation and service, which is uh, upasana, for them in this case, actually brahma upasana, hmm? done by sannyasis, according to this analysis. So here, the meaning is, I am not so pleased by performing the duties of brahmachari, 
Krihasta, Vanaprasta, or Sanyas, as I am pleased by one who listens and serves his Guru who is Brahmanishta. Then the other meaning which is more relevant to us is if the Guru is mm, Bhagavad Nishta, fixed in devotion to God, then Ija means worship to the deity, the archant to the deity. Then Prajatibya means receiving the Diksha Mantra, Gopa Mantra and remembering that faithfully three times a day. Mm. Then Tapasa means actually to focus the mind and go into meditation, Samadhi. And then Upasamena means the Krishna Nishta, that the consciousness is always fixed in Krishna and one is internally serving. So Krishna is saying, I am not so pleased by serving the deity, receiving initiation and remembering your Diksha Mantras, even by going into trans Samadhi and serving me internally, I am not so pleased by that person as much as I am pleased by that person who listens to the words of his Guru and serves him with great faith accordingly. This is astonishing. Mm. Huh? This is ast How pleased Krishna is by Guru Seva above any type of service, even advanced service to him in the state of Samadhi. Hmm? So Srila Siddha Swami, he says that from this verse it is to be understood that Guru Seva is completely Swatantra, it's completely independent. And therefore it is capable of bestowing all Siddhi even without the support of any other discipline or any other practice or any other anger of Bhakti. That is the glory of Guru Seva from the lips of Krishna himself remembering his own time in the Gurukul. Sila Gurudev ki jai, Sila Prabhupad ki jai, Itai Gaura Pramanande, Hare Hare Krishna. Are there any questions? Yes, I'd wait a problem. According to the etiquette, in order to um, respect the Vaishnava properly, we need to offer with respect according to Vaishnava's land. So that discrimination is important. But what if that Vaishnava is our spiritual master? Shall we have an absolute view of him or a relative view of him? No. The disciple should have absolute vision towards the spiritual master. Hmm? We said today, the, the first, one of the first verses we were discussing, Yasya Sakshat Bhagavati, Jnana hmm? Deepa Pratagara, the Guru who gives transcendental knowledge, he should be seen as direct manifestation of Bhagavan. So, I, in this regard, I want to um, give some examples from the life of our Gurudev, how he discussed these things. Once, Srila Gurudev was giving a darshan after his morning walk in Los Angeles. And uh, Shamarangi Titi was there, she wanted to ask a question. She said, so the spiritual master must be a Mahabhaga Gurudev stopped her immediately said, that is absurd. He said, when you come to devotional life, you are Kanisht Arikai. How will you know? Hmm? Hmm? Even for a Madhyamadikari, they cannot always identify who is a Mahabhagavat. It's very difficult. So how will you know? Hmm? He said, and such gurus are extremely rare. Generally, guru will be Madhyamadikari. Hmm? Guru Dev himself, he said, because we don't accept people, Guru Dev in his humility, he said, I may be Madhyamadikari guru. In his humility. But generally, Guru is in the Madhya Madhikarya, that is from Ruchi up to Bhav. Ruchi, that is not Madhya Madhikarya, that is Madhya Bhagavat. There's a difference. Konishta Adhikari is from Srada up to the, the end of Anatta Nivriti. It's Konishta Adhikari. Madhya Madhikarya is Nishta, and Uttam Adhikari is from Ruchi. 
because here the concept of Adhikari means three levels of eligibility to practice Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti. That's the context in which you find that discussion in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. So there's the three types of Adhikari. Then you have three types of Bhagavats. The Prakrita Bhakta, that is from the uh, Sadha up to Nishta, then the Madhyam Bhagavat, from Ruchi up to and including Bhav is Madhyam Bhagavat. And Uttam Bhagavat is from Prem, everything after that. Hmm? So you can see this distinction is made in Bhakti Tattva Vivek by Sila Bhakti Thakur. Because actually these are analysis of eligibility according to two different schools. Because the one is related to Vaidhi Bhakti, that is the analysis of Adhikari in the Pancharatriki line, because it's Vaidhi Bhakti. And so they're called Uttam, Madhyam and Kanishta Adhikari for Vaidhi Sadhan Bhakti. It's a Pancharatriki line. And then in the Bhagavat line, so they're called Madhyam Bhagavat Uttam Bhagavat, because that's the Bhagavat school. Hmm? So Prabhupada Pakistan Sutaku said, the Uttam Adhikari is practically a uh, Kanishta Bhagavat. In the Bhagavat school, Hmm? The Pancharatric Uttam is practically like a Konishta, but a high level of Konishta in the Bhagavad school. So these are different approaches to Bhakti, the Pancharatric line and the Bhagavad line. Now, so then Srila Gurudev said, oh, it is absurd, you cannot, you cannot know. And then she asked, what, but what if, if that person is not a, an Uttam Bhagavad, then how you become perfect? And then Srila Gurudev quoted the verse of Bhagavad Gita. He said, in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna has mentioned that those who worship the demigods actually are worshipping me, but not according to the correct vidhi. But whatever benedictions those demigods give to their followers are actually bestowed by me alone. So he said, in the same way, if the disciple's guru is a Madhyam Bhagavat, he's qualified to be guru, but whatever mercy is coming to that disciple is coming from Krishna. And if there's anything lacking in him, then Krishna will make up for that. Hmm? So you can see it was transcribed and it's been sent out also on the Harikata mailing list. That morning darshan with Gurudev. So that's another thing. So then, once in Bhaja on the morning walk, I asked Gurudev. Hmm? Obviously we know, if a Vaishnava comes from the spiritual world here, his body is Satchidananda. But if a Vaishnava is a sadhak going up here, is his body Satchidananda or is it spiritualized? In other words, the vrittis of the gunas have gone away and it's acting in the same way like Satchidananda. Just like iron is not fire, but put in fire, it takes on the quality of fire. This is my question at that point. If the guru is a sadhak going up, is, is, should the disciple see his body is Satchidananda or that is spiritualized? Mm -hmm. So Gurudev said, because actually, once the vritti of Swarup Shakti comes, there's no difference. Because the bhav which appears is Nitya Siddha bhav. So even the devotee is not Nitya Siddha, but his bhav is Nitya Siddha. Because all bhav is Nitya Siddha. Understand? So when I posed this question to Srila Gurudev, he said, even if Guru is a Madhya Madhikari, the disciple should see that his guru's body is Satyadananda, his cloth is Satyadananda, his shoes and his toothbrush, everything, all his prof, everything is Satyadananda. The disciples should see like that. Hmm? So we have given some praman from Bhagavatam, Yasa Sakshat Bhagavati, and we've given some pranam from Guru and Sadhu, directly from Srila Gurudev's lips, in regard to this question. Uh, I don't so, <coughs> did Krishna and Balaram, when they went to Vitara, is that when they discovered their brothers, or did they think they were brothers before? Um, according to the conception of the Mathura Basis, they're brothers because they have the same father. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but according to the conception of the Bridge Basis, they, they're not biologically brothers, because they have neither the same father or the same mother. But when Krishna and Balaram, they 
were bidding farewell to Nanda Maharaj in Mathura and telling him that he should return to Braj without them. Then, at that time, because Balaram actually was not the, as you would think in a human terms, biological son of Nanda Maharaj, he said to Nanda Maharaj, Oh Baba, that person is your father who raises you, who nourishes you and takes care of you for your whole life. That is your father. That's the main consideration. So Balaram was expressing that he really saw Nanda Maharaj as his father. That was his relation, that was his emotional relationship. He didn't have that relationship. He didn't even know about Sudev Maharaj. So in terms of his bath for Balaram, Nanda Maharaj is his father, and he has two mothers, uh, Choti Maya and Bari Maya. The big mother and the small mother. So the, the, the big mother is Rohini and the smaller mother is Yashoda. And Krishna also sees Rohini and Yashoda, they're, they're both his mothers. So that's the, that's the sentiment, the bhav with which they relate to each other. And uh, even when they're in Mathura, then Krishna, it's not that Krishna discovered that he's brothers with Balaram, because as he wrote to his father, he said, I never accepted I'm a Katriya. I'm a Gopal, I always be a Gopal, I'm just playing along with them. So Krishna maintains his Abhiman that he is Nanda Nanda. Yes? Uh, in the book, I have one question. I also have one question. They might mix together. So I'll just ask it in a, in a broader So, on a morning walk, also in Houston Guru, they've said the same thing. When the book asks, How should we see Guru according to if he's Baba Baba, if he's this, 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 every disciple, no, Nitya Siddha or Sunday Siddha. Right, yes, said, yes. Even if he's not, you should see, he's Nitya Siddha. The disciple should see his Guru like that. Yes. This was, this was morning walking. Houston in 2008, maybe. Yes, yeah. thank you. Yeah. But then another thing was the verse, Sasti Yuki Sumi Purna, Yeah. It says in the second line of that verse that that person, they also, Tare Samsa, he also can deliver those persons who come under his shelter. So this is because his Drita Shraddha is not only in Bhagavan, his Guru, but in Sadhu. Is that correct? No, because you mixed up a few verses here. Mm -hmm. Because there's Shastra Yukti Su Nipun, Dhrita Shatagya, Sai Utum Adikai, Jagatanista. But for Madhyam, it's Shastra Yukti Nahi Jani, Shastra Yukti Nahi Jani, Dhrita Sradhavan, Sai Madhyam Adikai Mahabhadyavan. But we can say here, because this is a discussion of Uttam Adhikari, right? So that Uttam Adhikari in the Pancharatriki Mark is actually Madhyam Bhag the beginning stage of Madhyam Bhagavat. So therefore, yes, the Madhyam Bhagavat can deliver the world. So your conclusion is right, but not on the basis of that verse. Because you said Shastra Rukti Sunipun, Dridashada Yar, it's Shastra Yukti Sunipun, um, uh, Shastra Yukti Sudhi sorry. Shastra Yukti Nahijani. The Madhyamadikari, it says he's Mahabhagyavan. The Madhyamadikari is Mahabhagavan. It doesn't say he can deliver the world. It says the Uttam can deliver the world. Ultimate eligibility for the practice of bhakti. Yes. So that Uttam in the Vaidhi Mark is he's really in the stage of Ruchi. So that means in the Bhagavat Mark, who's in the stage of Ruchi, the Madhyam Bhagavat, yes, he can deliver the world. Yes. So in that verse, correct. It says Shastri Yukti Suni Punya Drita Sharna Yana. That's Uttama in eligibility. Yes. The second part of the verse says Samsare Tariye Samsa. Uh -huh. That he can, that Uttam in eligibility. Yes. In fact, like, he can also de deliver. So I'm asking about the caveat. The caveat of can, meaning if he, his Drita. His Dhrita Shraddha yes. is in Guru, Sadhu, and Bhagavan equally. There's no obfuscation of Guru Abhiman. We yes. had a whole discussion yes, yes. one time. It's his, his Shraddha is especially in, uh, in Shastra, Shastriya Shraddha. Uh -huh. Yes. So Shastriya speaks of Guru Tattva, so automatically right. also he has faith in Guru. Uh -huh. yes. Because then in the party discussion was about Prabhupada's purport in the fifth shloka of Upadesha Amrita. Take shelter of Uttamadikari. Yes, yes. Uttamadikari is Madhyam Bhagavat. Right. <laughs> and then coming down, like in the case, Guru Dev is also described once, that Madhyam in 
Uttam mm-hmm. Majan would mean like here Yudh Pishai coming down from Bhagavad Prasad Prabh, he will come down to a level to make distinction. Mm-hmm. But he's coming from that side, coming down, and going up, even at the stage of Ruchi, which is Uttam in, mm-hmm. <laughs> I hope I'm not being confusing, but Uttam in that verse, he can also deliver disciples. We have this whole discussion here. Yes, yes. Yes. Yes, so well, you know, but it, it, it's clear in the verse, Vacho Vega Manasa Kroda Vega, it says, Pritivim Sasisyat, you can make disciples all over the world. world. That verse is the, discu- the description of the Madhyam Bhagavat. Yes. It's in the commentaries, it all yes. says, this is the qualification. Not Maha Bhagavat, necessarily, which is still a party no. not, yeah. But even you can see, let's say there's a Uttam Adhikari in Pancharataki Marg. Right. He's qualified for the Angas of Bhakti. Right. So one of the 64 Angas of Bhakti is, don't make many disciples, yeah. you see. So that's part of his sadhana. Yeah. To have disciples and to train them right. is one of the angas of bhakti for that Uttam Adhikari in the Pancharatriki Marg. Right. You understand? Mm. But he shouldn't have many because he's not so powerful that he can digest so much karma and not so powerful that just by his meditations he can support and nourish everyone who he just met them, you know, because a, a great person like Narad can wander here and there, just give initiation on the spot to someone and then maintain them from a distance, all of these things. So that that, that, that type of guru, he should spend time with the disciples and train them. So if he has a lot, then he won't be able to discharge the responsibilities properly. That means that then the disciples will not be satisfied and the guru will not be able to do that sadhana of training the disciples, which is one of the angas of bhakti, so there it said, sorry, one of the angles of bhakti that don't take many, it should be a manageable number and it should be done nicely and that will be, that will contribute to the growth of the disciples and, and the guru also, who is Uttam Adhikai. Yes, train them. <laughs> train them, train them, yes. Too many people giving out beads and threads without training anybody. Yeah. Then the question comes, if you're making a distinction between kinds of guru, you said, that kind of guru. Yes. So then how does the disciple think, well, what kind of guru is my guru? So that's, we, that was the previous question. Did you hear the previous oh, question and answer? The yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the vision of the disciple cannot be relative. Because we have two things going on here. Guru is Vaishnav and also Krishna's appearing. So the guru may be different levels of Vaishnav, but the Krishna who is appearing is Krishna. Right? So the delegation of Krishna present in that Vaishnava is absolute. Mm-hmm. Yes. Is that satisfying? Is that clear for everyone? Yes. Mm-hmm. But it also means that everyone is Madhyam Adhika because they're using the verse um, Prema Maitri Kipu Daksha. That's Madhyam Bhagavat. Madhyam Bhagavat, not exactly. Not, not Madhyam Adhika. That's Madhyam Bhagavat. He has prayed. Yes. He has prayed. Yeah. yeah. But this praying here, the word praying, the Acharya's comment, just means Shuddha Bhakti. Yeah. So Shuddha Bhakti appears from Ruchi. Yes. yes. So praying isn't here like, the yeah, stage after yeah, Bhav. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just means yeah. Shuddha Bhakti, which is from the stage of Ruchi. Right. Yeah. Yes, then. There was a time in Srila Prabhupada's life and Srila Gurudev's life when they weren't famous. Mm-hmm. And it didn't seem that most people recognized their power, their stature. Yes. And then all of a sudden, they're world famous yes. and have thousands of followers. Is there something that happens in their lives, like some milestone that all of a sudden, you know, is there something different that happens that, that you know, is that... How does that happen? That's the, that's the will of Krishna that the, the Acharya becomes self-effulgent. He's already qualified. Or, in some cases, they may become qualified, but at a certain point, the mercy of Gornitai reveals to the certain Vaishnavas the stature of that devotee. That's why it said in Chaitanya Charitamrita, Du by Ridhiyakshalandaka, Du Bhagavat Sandhi Karna Sachikar. The mercy of Gornitai is that at your heart is illuminating, allowing you to re- recognize the special position of the book Bhagavat and the devotee Bhagavat. So when certain devotees 
they have that mercy of Gornitai and they recognize the book Bhagavat and the person Bhagavat and then they also those who are not qualified to recognize they may encourage them the Madhyama Adhikaris are bringing the Konishta Adhikaris also to learn from them so this is all Krishna's will the different Acharyas became become powerful at different times in in history hmm. one thing I want to say which is very important the first anger of Bhakti is called Guru Pad Ashray the first anger of bhakti is not initiation. Mm -hmm. That's the second anger of bhakti. So Srila Gurudev in his commentary on Madhuri Kadambini gives a most wonderful <coughs> explanation of Guru Pad Ashray and its necessity. He said, at that time, the disciple takes shelter of his prospective guru. So the prospective disciple, does Guru Pad Ashray take shelter of the prospective guru? It's a provisional relationship. It's not fixed yet. And he should hear and he should serve for a minimum period of one year. That is given in Haribatvas. Now consider this. In the ideal situation, he'll live with the Guru. So he'll see him every day for 365 days and serve him. So nowadays, if a Guru is a traveling and they're meeting someone for three days, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, once a year, that year is not really a year. Right? According to the ideal situation in Shastra. Of course, there's possibility now to see the live streams and everything. Pronounced all the Vaishnavas watching at home. Except for the ones who were here in the last year didn't come. <laughs> Please come tomorrow. It's not very far away. Give me your darshan so I can be purified by your Vaishnav darshan. So, the, the idea is that the disciples and Guru should spend time together with each other so the Guru can understand the swabhav of the disciple and the disciple can understand to his limited ability the nature of the Guru to see how they are compatible. And during that time of service, Srila Gurudev describes that as the devotee is serving, he begins to realize how the delegation of the Supreme Lord is present in this Vaishnava because he's answering the questions even before the questions are asked. Uh, and so by various experiences or interaction with that Vaishnava, his faith is getting stronger and stronger. And then when his faith that the Guru Tattva is present in that Vaishnava is strong, now his heart is a fertile soil to receive initiation. Hmm? So Srila Gurudev said that the, the initiation, it's not... Um, a ritual or formality or something external or everyone's doing it so let's do it mm. no but the initiation is actually the fruit of Guru Pad Ashray mm. so one has to go through that stage first and when that stage is mature the fruit of Guru Pad Ashray namely the strong faith that comes from the realizations which have been accrued through serving and hearing uh, bring one to that state where the next anger of bhakti, which is diksha, can take place. Mm -hmm. So, though Srila Gurudev, being a great Mahabhagavat like Narad, would sometimes just give initiation mm -hmm. quite quickly to persons. Mm -hmm. Yet, he's written in his own books the standard that he wants among his followers. So, it's not our duty to imitate him, it's our duty to follow his instruction and his conception. Mm -hmm. Agreed? So, also we saw that uh, during Gurudev's later years that he would not personally screen the devotees who were coming for initiation but he would give that uh, responsibility to his seniors they would check who's qualified and unqualified and then bring them to him. So he, Gurudev, uh, outwardly from a, from a relative perspective was depending on the judgment of his senior devotees to bring qualified persons and unqualified persons which they'll wait and develop their faith. Because actually Yasyopadesha Shivanamaparadha in the ten offenses to the holy name to give to actually it means to give initiation to a person whose faith is not properly developed. That's an offense to the holy name. So just uh, last year at the time of Srila Gurudev's, uh, the installation of Srila Gurudev's Vigraha in his uh, Pushpa Samadhi in Govardhan, I was with our Pujapad Bhaktidanta Bhagat Maharaj 
and we went into the room of Param Pujapad Sila Bhakti Vigyan Bharati Maharaj. At that time there was a little controversy going on because uh, the senior devotees around Maharaj, they were basically deciding who was qualified to take Diksha from him. So persons who didn't really, from external vision, know were taking initiation and there was talk about someone who takes sannyas and someone was saying, no, this person should take sannyas because something that happened many years ago, it would reflect poorly on Maharaj. You remember it? Yeah? So at that time, Parampujapa Sila Bhakti Vigyan Bharati Maharaj said a very wonderful thing. He said, if a devotee comes to me and I know him and I ascertain his adhikar and then after some time decide to give him initiation, then I take all the karma from that disciple. But if you, the senior devotees, you bring people to me who are unqualified and I initiate them, then you take the karma. Wow. <laughs> and Gurudev said the same thing to me. Uh -huh. He said, if, if you bring me an unqualified person and that person falls down, it's your responsibility. Yes. And at that time, that person who wanted to take sannyas, Bharti Maharaj asked me, he said, I don't know him, but I know you. I know you since you're 25 years old. So I'm asking you, should I give him or I not give him sannyas? I mm -hmm. said, no, don't give him. Because I know this will create big disturbance and it will injure your reputation. So mm -hmm. don't give. Mm -hmm. So he said, okay. And you would get the car also. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, so he said, no. but I wasn't thinking for me. Yes, I, I, I was I thinking for yes. him. Yes. That yes. what it would do to his reputation if he did that. Yes, yes, yes. That was my concern because of my love for him. So I told him, please don't do this. So he said, okay, because you're recommending I won't do it. So in this way, this morning, just to summarize, we tried to present, firstly, the foundation of Guru Tattva, the philosophical foundation of Guru Tattva ex, ex, uh, expressed by Sri Krishna himself. Then after that, we have discussed the loving relation between Guru and disciple and the and evidence directly from Sri Krishna's mouth about the completely swatantra, independent nature of Guru Seva, that it's not dependent on any other anger of bhakti and it is competent to give all perfection without even practicing hearing, chanting and remembering. Now that someone that to some people that may sound obscene, but that is the fact that Guru Seva has that independent power. All the scriptures have explained that. Yet still Srila Gurudev said one should not take that as an excuse to not do proper sadhana. Because those who would take that as an excuse to not do proper sadhana also not doing really proper Guru Seva. <laughs> actually. You know? So don't take that in the wrong way. And then finally, we discussed about different levels of uh, qualification of Guru in the various lines, Pancharatrik and Bhagwat, and also the correct process, how our Acharyas and Srila Sanat Goswami, Gopal Bhatta Goswami and Srila Gurudev, they suggested the ideal way in which the initiations go on. So there's a summary I'd like to, I'd like to complete there. It's been a long morning. And so we'll sing one kirtan. And please, if you have the opportunity, come for Nagar Sankirtan in the evening. And tomorrow morning at 9.30, we'll begin Bajans and the Sunday program. Gora Premanande. Hare Krishna.